Hello everybody and welcome to Plant Medicine Meets Biotech, our first presentation of this year's free online seminar series of the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology. We will talk about how the combination of our knowledge of sometimes ancient medicinal plants and modern biotechnology is about to improve our understanding and medicine. Let me show you why plant-based drugs are, even to this day, fundamental to our medicine and how we can enrich our possibilities in healing if we unlock their full potential. First, plant medicine. To some people this term might sound a little bit outdated, possibly like antique or medieval medicine, maybe even superstitious beliefs. However, in a scientific context, plant medicine is nothing like that. When modern biologists, biochemists and doctors talk about plant medicine, they are usually referring to the high, highly bioactive compounds that are either discovered in plants or that are still produced only in plants. Which is usually because these molecules can quickly become so complex and intricate that even our modern chemists cannot efficiently reproduce them in the lab. Let me give you some examples as a small taste on how, just how much value modern medicine still derives from natural substances from plants. Well, actually, since about 50% of all drugs that we use in modern medicine are in fact plant-based, it would be easy to compile a never-ending list of examples. But instead, let me just give you two or three quick examples so we get, can get some inspiration. Here you see the world-famous anti-malaria drug artemisinin. It accumulates in iron-rich environments in our bodies, like for example our red blood cells, and decays into extremely reactive parts, so-called radicals. Since the malaria, par malaria parasite lives inside red blood cells, it gets damaged heavily by these radicals, which is one step towards healing. This important drug comes directly out of a very abundant plant, the sweet wormwood, or in Latin, Artemisia annua. Here's another example for modern plant medicine. This plant did in fact kickstart a whole branch of pain medicine. It's opium poppy, in Latin Papaver somniferum. It produces, as its name already states, opium. Opium is the dried sap from these capsules you can see here, and it contains several important tools of our modern medicine, the opiate painkillers. In the sap we already find several opiates like morphine and codeine, both of which are essential in treating acute and heavy pain. Inspired from these substances, a wide variety of derivatives, this means chemical variations, was developed. From Bayer's infamous cough syrup heroin <laughs> to the extremely strong fentanyl. Many opiates like morphine are to this day produced in plants and then chemically extracted, since they cannot be synthesized efficiently by classical chemistry. As a final example for important medicinal plants, I want to show you a plant that we work on ourselves here in our institute in Jena and which saved hundreds of thousands of lives over the last decades, even though many of you might not even have heard of it. This is the Madagascar periwinkle, also called Catharanthus roseus. It produces these really extremely complex molecules vincristine and vinblastine, both of which are essential anti-cancer medicines. They are part of classical chemotherapy, where they kill cells that try to divide and proliferate. Since cancer cells generally prolif proliferate much faster than healthy cells, uh, they get much more heavily damaged. Against certain types of cancer, this approach is extremely effective, although modern research of course tries to find methods with less side effects than classical chemotherapy. Nonetheless, uh, here again, these extremely complex molecules can simply not get synthesized effectively by our chemistry, and uh, so even in the year 2020 we rely on growing these plants and extracting these molecules from them to obtain the crucial medicine. But why is it that plants are such extraordinary chemists? Why would evolution shape them to produce these enormously complex and bioactive molecules that even we, today, 
cannot efficiently synthesize. To understand this mystery, try your fantasy and imagine for a moment you are a plant. You grow exactly where your seed fell by accident and you will never be able to do even one step to the left or to the right. You are absolutely bound to live your whole life on this one spot, no matter what challenges might await you. You will have to deal with all kinds of weathers, for example, from weeks of dry sun to wet, cold and dark nights. Then there are many plant-eating bugs around and you can bet that they will very quickly find you. Some of them will go for your roots, others will try to find weakness in your leaves. How do you fend them off? Then there are big animals like deers, goats or bunnies that can eat you whole in a matter of seconds or minutes depending on your size. How will you defend against them? And of course that's still not all of it. You also have other tasks to do. You need to attract pollinators so that they help you procreate by carrying your pollen to sexual partners, which of course you cannot do by yourself. And maybe you want to communicate with other plants via volatile substances. For example, like the tobacco plant, which warns others about herbivores so that everybody can increase their nicotine production as a defense mechanism. All these problems and more have to be solved without ever leaving your spot of birth. So how can you do this? Among many other strategies, one of your best chances is to produce the right chemicals for the right job. You can produce chemicals to fend off bugs, to be toxic to deers, to attract pollinators and to communicate with other plants. These necessities led many plants to become really remarkable chemists with a wide repertoire of chemical substances that help with all these tasks. And if we are curious and careful enough, we can find these substances we can understand their potential and then use them for our own well-being. So what's the problem then, right? We have millions of species of plants on this planet, most of them full with interesting chemicals. Apart from problems of habitat destruction and the extinction of plants, even if we find interesting substances in a plant, this doesn't mean we can directly use them. And that's because to use any substance, you first need to have it in sufficient amounts. You need to produce them cheaply and sustainably. And that's where we often find problems. Some plants produce their interesting substances only in very minute amounts. And you will need to harvest tons and tons of them to just get mere milligrams of your substance. Some of these plants might even grow extremely slowly. Think, for example, of trees. And then there are others that you might not be able to cultivate at all. Maybe because they need very specific symbiotic interactions which only happen in their natural habitat. Many interesting plants are also very rare. And if you try to collect them in the wild, you would quickly risk to make them go extinct. So I guess we all see the dilemma now. Plants produce extremely useful and extremely complex substances but there might just be no way to cheaply and sustainably produce them. And that's where modern biology comes into play. One of the most widespread concepts in biotechnology is to use genetic engineering to obtain hard to get substances, be it small molecules, proteins, lipids or other natural compounds. The fundamental idea is that since all, since the secret to produce all these substances uh, are encoded in the organism's DNA, it should be in theory be possible to transfer this DNA into another, better suited organism. An organism that grows quickly and in cheap media. And then this organism will do the complex production for us. So the idea is quickly explained, but as you can all imagine, easier said than done. Biotechnology is a complex art that involves a lot of expertise in a lot of different fields. I will give you a quick run through to give you a picture on how modern biotechnology is done. First, you start with an interesting plant which produces an interesting compound. 
You already know about this compound, but you just cannot get it affordably from this plant. To find out how this plant is performing this little miracle, you need to read into its genetic code, its DNA. Sequ uh, sequencing this DNA is step one. Step two, you have to understand what you just sequenced. After all, a DNA sequence is nothing more than a miles long linear sequence of the four letters of our genome, adenosine, thymine, guanine and cytosine. It is not at all trivial to know from these letters which part of the code means what. This gets further complicated by the fact that genes that are involved in the production of one specific substance do not always lie together closely on the DNA. They can be scattered widely over the whole genome. To identify your genes, the next expertise must come into play. Using algorithms, you can compare your new sequences to older ones that we already investigated. Even though the sequence of your, of your plant is new code, since all living beings are related to each other and share huge amounts of their code, you can compare them to each other. Especially if you are lucky and other plants from the same family of plants were already sequenced and researched. You can use this already established information as a starting point for your new project. However, of course theory and algorithms alone are not enough to prove anything in biology. These methods can only help you to find candidate genes which could be involved in the production of your substance of interest. The most important part here is to investigate the role of these genes piece by piece to really understand what each part of the code does and how these genes and gene products interact with each other to produce your desired compound. Now that you identified all genes that are necessary to construct your biosynthetic pathway, you have to put them all together into a new piece of DNA that is suitable to genetically alter your organism of choice. For, for this you have to follow several rules which determine if your DNA will be readable by the new organism. Each gene comes not only with its so-called coding sequence, that's the part of the DNA that corresponds directly to the amino acid sequence of the encoded protein, but also with all kinds of secondary information. There are for example regulatory parts that determine when and how much a gene is used by an organism like transcriptional promoters and terminators, ribosomal binding sites and operator and repressor sequences. Only after you took all this into consideration, you can create a genetic construct that carries all the information for your, the production of your substance and with which you can transform then the organism of your choice. So, now you put your well-prepared and meticulously crafted genetic construct into your new organism and finally you have a cheap and sustainable source for your substance of interest, right? Wrong. Living organisms are immensely complex systems and even our best biological and biochemical theories cannot describe them in detail. We simply don't know everything that there is to know about on how life works and when you try to do engineering without complete knowledge of what you're working with, there will always be surprises. Usually these surprises look like, um, oh no, my newly engineered organisms do nothing. If you're more lucky, they produce the substance you're looking for, but only in very low amounts. However, if you got that far, now a process of bug fixing and optimization starts. Several rounds of trial and error of change and experiment are necessary until satisfying results appear. For this process again a huge amount of knowledge, experience and also a little bit of luck is needed. But when it works, then finally you created something of very high value. You found a source for a scarce and wonderful substance without the need to grow and harvest tons of plants. No need to use up land, water, chemicals and other resources in the same amount. And even better, nobody has to go into the rainforest and harvest rare plants. So who do you think has all these different kinds of expertise? 
who can manage all these jobs and be an expert in all these fields? Uh, the answer of course is nobody. There is not a single person who would be able to perform all these complicated jobs by themselves. This means it's time for teamwork. I want to show you an example on how biotechnological science is performed today. If you have the picture in your mind of a scientist as a lone wolf, maybe a singular genius who waits for her eureka moment, and then you are mistaken. Let's see what I mean here. Here is an example of a very interesting biotechnological project that tries to do exactly the steps I just mentioned before. To produce plant substances in a better suited organism. This is the Miami project, which is an acronym and has nothing to do with the US city, by the way. The point is, to achieve their goal, a team was created, involving four different university groups and three industry partners, who all came together to share their expertise and workforce. Now, the, the Miami project is financed by the European Union. And so these seven partners come from five different countries, Italy, France, Germany, the Netherlands and Denmark. It is one of many examples for true international teamwork. So what's their goal? There is an extremely interesting class of substances called the monoterpenoid indole alkaloids, in short, MIAs. They include a variety of strongly bioactive compounds like the anti-cancer medicines vincristine and vinblastine we talked about earlier, the poison strychnine, the psychedelic substance ibogaine, and many more. In fact, we know that there are more than 2000 MIA compounds out there in nature, most of which we still have no idea what their effects on humans, fungi or bacteria would be. As you already guessed, there is a reason why all these substances are not yet well researched. They are very, very hard to get. Some of them only appear in the most minute amounts in some rare plants. Many more might not yet be explored at all. A central intermediate of many, although not all, MIAs is strictosidin. If we were able to just produce strictosidin in microorganisms, it would already unlock research and business opportunities with many, many more substances. How do we achieve biotechnological production of strictosidin and other MIAs? The idea is to transfer the genetic information of plants which can produce these substances into an organism that is much better suited for large-scale production. A famous organism, in fact, an organism that everybody of you knows and have, has already heard of and has even eaten. The organism of choice is the baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, by its Latin name. This organism that is literally used for baking bread and brewing beer since thousands of years, grows quickly and on cheap media and also possesses an advanced cellular machinery that is superior to bacteria ones in many use cases. On the left you see how yeast looks in the supermarket then on an agar plate, under the microscope, and as a cartoon that I will use from now on in this talk. But still, why yeast, you might ask? In fact, this organism was already part of many great achievements in modern biotechnology. There might be hundreds of great examples where yeast played a crucial part in biotechnological advancements. But again, here are just two famous examples. First, artisaminin. The anti-malaria drug we just talked about before can nowadays actually be produced by genetically engineered yeast. Even though wormwood is easy to grow, this still is celebrated as a big step towards cheaper and more sustainable production of this crucial anti-malaria drug. Below this you can see a very recent example that was published just this year. The production of the psychedelic compound psilocybin in genetically engineered yeast. Psilocybin produces effects comparable to LSD and gets researched in multiple clinical studies for its healing effects for trauma, depression and addiction. If it makes it successfully through these studies, this will create a huge demand for psilocybin in psychiatry and this invention might play a role in setting up reliable and cheap supply chains. So how does this international collaboration work? 
every team member is a specialist for one of the tasks that have to be done to make sustainable MIA supply happen, starting from the plant and going all the way to purified substance from yeast. We remember step one, sequence the plant. The Dutch company Future Genomics Technologies will deliver on this part. As Miami is a research project, they showcase one of the most advanced DNA sequencing technologies available, nanopore sequencing. This brand new technology works by having a thin but electrically insulating membrane in a very small liquid filled well. In this membrane there is only one tiny hole, a pore protein that lets DNA pass through it. On one side of the membrane they put the DNA that should be sequenced. As you might remember, DNA is a negatively charged molecule. This means if an electrical voltage is laid over the membrane, the DNA gets sucked to the positive pole. It gets sucked through the one single pore. While passing through this pore, every single base of this DNA changes the electrical current that flows through that pore for a very short time. The trick is now to measure these changes in electrical current and calculate which kind of base passed through that hole at which time. The sequence of changes of electrical current is identical with the sequence of the DNA bases. It is really mind-blowing to think that something like this could even work, but in fact it can. And FG Tech is utilizing it to sequence plant genomes for the Miami project. What was step two again? Right. After sequencing the DNA, you have to learn to read it, to understand it. Before you can engineer anything, you need to understand all the parts you want to use. Two specialist teams on monoterpenoid indole alkaloids joined the effort here. They tried to find out which genes are necessary to produce which near compounds. Both the group of Vincent Cota Wolf from the University of Tours in France and the group of Sarah O'Connor, director of the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology in Jena, are specialists in this kind of work. To find out which part of the genome produces which compound, they compare the newly sequenced genome to already known ones. They test the emerging candidate genes by isolating the respective proteins and to test them meticulously, they try to find their substrates and reaction conditions they even illuminate their atomic 3D structures. These groups provide the necessary basis for all following steps of biotechnological work. At this point it is time for the next team partner to step in. The Italian company Explora Biotech and their business unit Dulix try to streamline and automate DNA construct design. After the previous groups discovered and characterized all kinds of genes in the original plant, you need to assemble them in a new way that is suitable to genetically engineer your yeast cells. Dulix developed a tool for biologists to simply upload the DNA sequences and immediately get a recommendation for how to assemble them to fit the new target organism. Another big project inside Dulix is to create a big library of well-characterized and standardized biological parts that can then be used for easy plug-and-play design of new genetic circuits. Advances like that are believed by many to be necessary to speed up biotechnological progress. At this point we are approaching our final goal, the sustainable and cheap production of plant substances in yeast cells. We have all genes that are necessary to produce a specific, interesting compound arranged, right? The next expertise is to put these constructs into yeast, to test them quickly and efficiently, and to optimize and to fix bugs in the genetic pathway. This so-called rapid prototyping also enables them to test many more variants of genetic constructs than could usually be handled. This results in better chances to find working or even optimal genetic constructs for a given task. The research team of Michael Jensen from the Denmark Technical University is specialized in exactly this kind of work. They use miniaturized cultivation techniques to cheaply assess if a given genetic circuit does what it should do. They are also researching modern screening technologies and even want to couple successful production 
to the growth of the engineered organisms for even easier screening. In modern bioreactors, these are closed tanks full of growth media, um, they can exactly determine which amount of nutrients, oxygen, pH value and many other variables are optimal for the production of a specific compound. If we reach this point, then finally we can produce mere substances in yeast. But why did we want to do this again in the first place? Right, because they promise medical advances. This is the reason why the Miami project is also partnered with the French company Axintus, which has lots of experience in the production of pharmaceutical compounds and preclinical studies, for example animal testing. The MIA compounds that can now be produced reliably and cheaply in yeast will be tested for their bioactivity in mice. The most promising compounds will later be produced in bigger amounts using these huge modern bioreactors. The availability of these compounds will then hopefully spark medical, economical and scientific advances and benefit social society in general in this way. So this was our overview about plant medicine meets biotech. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe learned even something along the way about modern biotechnology and its potentials for us. As you could see, science really is a matter of teamwork, of international teamwork usually. The Miami project and other European Horizon 2020 projects are great examples for international friendship and collaboration. And if you are interested in the Miami project or other EU 2020 projects, you can follow them on Twitter and LinkedIn. You can find the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology on Facebook and Twitter too. I wish you all a good day and I hope we see you for our next seminar, Sprechende Pappeln und wie wir ihnen zuhören können. A presentation in German by Franziska Eberl about talking trees. Goodbye and see you next time.